Salisbury Cathedral is remarkable because it's surrounded by expanses of grass, so it's easy to take in the whole building as a unified composition. That's thanks to James Wyatt in the late 18th century. He cleaned the whole place up, though some people call him Wyatt the Destroyer. The surrounding close is paradoxically very spacious. You often read that it's the finest cathedral close in England, with its desirable looking buildings ranging from medieval to Georgian. John Constable painted various views here, and Anthony Trollope is supposed to have got inspiration for his Barchester novels. The cathedral itself was built in one continuous process, beginning in 1220. It's a complete expression, some would say the most perfect embodiment, of the early English style of Gothic. The tower and spire were added later, after a pause of another 50 years, and they formed the climax of the building in the more sumptuous decorated style. Yet there's no sense of disharmony, and the progression upwards seems organic. The spire is built of stone, and it's what Salisbury is famous for. At 404 feet, it's the highest in the country. Salisbury has always been a secular cathedral. There's never been a monastery or convent here. The see, or seat of the bishop, was originally at Sherbourne. Then, shortly after the Norman conquest, it moved to Old Sarum, which is now little more than a windy hill a mile or two north of the city. Old Sarum was a bit bleak, and it suffered from a water shortage. So the bishop asked the Pope for permission to move the cathedral. The present site certainly doesn't suffer from any shortage of water. In fact, the cathedral has sometimes been flooded. Apart from its beauty, Salisbury is important because of its influence. The way the cathedral was run, by a dean and a group of canons, and also the pattern of its services, the Sarum Rite, became a model for other parts of England, and even France. In our own time, Salisbury pioneered the introduction of a girls' choir, though they've also kept their boys. The two, in fact, don't sing together, but at different services. So Salisbury is adapting, as it always has.
I'm standing on the lawns to the northeast of Salisbury Cathedral, and with me is Colin Watts. Colin, what is your job exactly here? Well, I'm the chairman of the Day Guides, uh, which is one part of the guiding system in the cathedral, and there are 120 guides that do Monday to Saturday. This is a very good view of the building. We can see <coughs> to the right the nave with the north porch, then the transept, the main transept that is, and above it the tower and the famous spire. Half the tower's covered with scaffolding at the moment. And then a smaller transept, northeast transept, the choir and the lady chapel. The whole thing looks very unified. It has a very slender, you might almost say ethereal kind of grace. Was it designed by one person, Colin? Two people were really responsible. Elias de Derham, who became the clerk of works, and he was really responsible for the money side of things. And then the, the mason, Nicholas of Ely, was the man who really responsible for laying out uh, the foundations and conceiving in his mind the whole sort of totality of the cathedral. And those two men were here, fortunately, for 25 years. And so there was tremendous continuity. The style looks to me almost like copybook of early Gothic. The effect is very pointed, very vertical. The windows are tall, narrow, lancet-like and they're grouped sometimes in threes, sometimes in twos. It's almost correct to say that it is a prototype a cathedral. It was uh, the first cathedral that was built in the early English Gothic style, a tremendous departure from those cathedrals that had been built before, the Saxon cathedrals and the Norman cathedral with its rounded windows and its very enormous pillars and squat walls, almost castle-like. And this was a great departure. And it has this uniqueness about it in that it was built from start to finish in about 38 years and therefore has an architectural integrity about it. I've read 60 <coughs> years. You said 38 years. 38 years, 1220 to 1258, when it was consecrated, and then the West End was completed about 1266. Of course, there was no concept at the outset for the towers and the spires, which are Salisbury Cathedral's crowning glory, and that occurred about 50 years after.
we've just walked across the lawns and now we're standing in front of the west front of Salisbury Cathedral. I noticed some marks in the grass, Colin. What were they? Well, the largest mark is the foundations of the old Belfry Tower, which was a very substantial tower, 200 feet tall, and it housed all the bells and the clock, and it was used uh, for a whole series of purposes, uh, some of them not so good. And indeed, in the uh, Civil War, the Royalists were locked up in the Belfry Tower, and um, the Cromwellians set fire to it to try and uh, kill them. And over the years, it gradually became fairly dilapidated. And in 1790, when James Wyatt was asked to come down and tidy the place up, he decided, funds not being all that marvellous, to pull it down. I think he has provided a setting beyond compare for this cathedral. Before then, there was a most enormous muck uh, there were dirty old channels, there were cows grazing, and it needed tidying up. And whilst Wyatt certainly earned his name as a destroyer, he didn't really earn it for setting out this beautiful setting. That was one of the good things that he did. And he did tidy some of the additions to the cathedral, particularly at the East End at the Trinity Chapel, where two chantry chapels were taken down. I make the point Trinity Chapel because, unlike most cathedrals, Salisbury Cathedral does not have a lady chapel. The entire cathedral is handed over to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And so we call the lady chapel where it would normally be the Trinity Chapel. Looking at the West Front, it's kind of screen covered in niches and statues with two turrets at each end with pinnacles on the top. Were there statues in medieval times? There were statues in medieval times, but not in all the niches. I think there are either seven, some people say eight, original statues left. The remainder of them are largely Victorian and some of them are in a very dangerous condition. And as you can see, with the southern side of this screen front, clad in cheating and workmen, an awful lot of repair work is needed there. There's a painting by Constable, mm -hmm. one of many paintings he did of Salisbury Cathedral, mm -hmm. which is now in the National Gallery in London, and in it, you can just about make out that there's a kind of crenellation along the top of the West Front. What happened to that? I had always thought that it was Gilbert Scott in about 1860 or 70 had removed them. But in fact, they were removed slightly before that, about 1820. Why? I'm not entirely sure whether they were becoming unsafe, whether it was considered at the time unsightly. I'm not sure, uh, but you can quite see quite clearly they are no longer there. And it does give a rather stark finish to the top of the screen. <laughs>
now we've come inside Salisbury Cathedral and we've climbed up a narrow spiral staircase which the public doesn't normally come up and we're standing in a gallery at the west end of the nave and we have a fantastic view towards the east end and we can see below us the arcades which are actually very lofty and on our level we see the gallery or triforium and above the triforium we see the clerestory with its windows and then the vault across the top. It's quite a long nave. There are ten bays. There are two colours. There's a light grey stone and there's a darker stone. Well, the darker stone is called Purbeck marble. In fact, that's a misnomer. It's not marble at all. It's a crushed shell and limestone which comes uniquely from Purbeck Island, about 30, 40 miles away, near Swanage. It is used in the main for decorative purposes, and it does give, as you say, this very distinct difference in greyness uh, to the whiter Chilmark limestone, uh, which is used in a major part of the heavy construction of the cathedral. We see the Purbeck marble largely flanking all the pillars in the arcading and again very heavily used in the triforium level and again up in the clear story and at the crossing the four major pillars are almost clad in perbet marble slender columns they go right the way up to the vault absolutely the whole way and this is the most marvellous view and again reinforces the unity of the architectural style of this cathedral. It's uniform outside and here remarkably uniform inside as well. We can see right through to the high altar which slightly surprises mm. me. Was there ever a mm. screen? Yes. It had a screen right up until about 1959. Essentially, there were three screens. The original screen uh, was a stone screen uh, built at the same time as the cathedral, medieval stonework, which was removed by James Wyatt in the period when he was doing his work, 1788 to 1792. And he built another stone screen uh, from the bits and pieces that he had recovered from the two chantry chapels that he took down from the either side of the Trinity Chapel. And on top of that screen, there was an enormous organ placed that was given anonymously by a gentleman from Berkshire, who actually everybody knew was George III. <laughs> and then that was removed in Gilbert Scott's time and he did a lot of his work sort of 1860 onwards or thereabouts and that was replaced by a very light cast iron screen by Skidmore which was eventually removed in 1959 to produce this lovely uncluttered view 454 feet uh, to the east end.
Now we've come downstairs in Salisbury Cathedral and we're standing under the central tower at the crossing where the main transept joins the nave. Beyond us is the choir. Looking up, we can't see up into the tower. We have a quite decorative vault. These very, very tall clusters of pier seem to be slightly bent. Are we safe? Well, you're quite right, they are bent. But I do hope we're safe, because the six and a half thousand tons of stone, which was added when the tower and spire had been completed, pressed down for 80 years, and then these dear old columns could take it no longer and started to bend. You imagine the clerk of works walking around the cathedral in the morning in 1420, looking up and thinking to himself, my golly, what are we going to do about that? What did they do? Well, they built initially these two girder arches here, and they were built about 1450, 1460. They have screen-like tracery, don't they? Yes. It slightly, it rather disagrees, rather contradicts the style of the rest of the building. They do look out of place, you're absolutely right. But in addition to that, at the Triforium level and at the Clearstory level, they built these internal flying buttresses on both sides of each column, two at the Triforium level, one at the Clearstory level. And that fixed it, so we are safe. And indeed, in about 1688, Sir Christopher Wren was asked to come and do a survey of the tower and the spire. And the first thing he did was to drop a plumb line from the center of the tower and mark where it fell on the floor. And you'll see here a little brass plaque with a little spot saying the center of the tower. He then clambered up the spire and about 40 feet from the top, got out of a little trap door, measured the shape and the size of the spire, came down and engraved that on the floor. And here you see it, this octagonal, and measured where the center of that fell. And you'll see it's 27 and a half inches out to the southwest. So the spire and the tower lean to the southwest. Not like the Leaning Tower of Pisa, because it's fixed and it hasn't moved uh, since about 1480.
Now we've come into the choir at Salisbury Cathedral, Colin, and the choir stalls look very dark. They look rather Victorian. Well, actually, they're slightly later than that. But one has to be careful, because the actual choir pews, except for the carvings on the top, and I'm talking really about four feet from the ground, are contemporaneous with the building of the cathedral. These dark canopies, and indeed the very tall bishop's throne, are much later and are, I think, sometime in the 20s. 1920s? Yes, very, very recent. How much has this part of the cathedral changed over the years? From a structural point of view, quite a bit. And that really has been associated with the moving of the high altar. Where was it originally? About 15 feet east of where the present choir stalls finish. And indeed, you can see these large purbeck columns on either side there. They are the only columns in the cathedral that have carved capitals. And it is assumed that they were placed either side of where the high altar was. It was moved back in 1790 or thereabouts when Wyatt was doing his destruction. And he included the whole of the Trinity Chapel and the present sanctuary here as one choir. And the high altar was moved right to the furthest east end of the cathedral. It only lasted 30 years because it was clearly a nonsense. And it's been moved back now to where you can see it, halfway between where it was originally and the Far East End.
and it was moved and placed here uh, in 1790 and it is a 8 to 10 foot tall stone screen with about six niches on either side of the central door. But above you will see a tracery of angels uh, and attached to the angels' wings you can see some of the original gilding. Underneath the angels uh, you will see a little face carved, not religious faces at all. Those are the faces of the stonemasons who carved this screen. And what is interesting is to look and see the features. There's one that's almost negroid, which just goes to show that these stonemasons were a tremendous international guild of people who moved about all over Europe. And here we see them frozen in stone for us to admire today. we've come to the easternmost part of Salisbury Cathedral and we're in the Trinity Chapel which is much lower than the choir. It's very delicate in its effect because it has these extremely slender 
single perfect marble columns, four of them. Now, the Trinity Chapel is almost dominated, I would say, by these lancet windows over the altar, and they have this rather lurid blue glass. Colin, when was that put in? It was put in in 1980. It was a man from Chartres, Gabriel Loire, who designed and installed it. And if you've ever been to Chartres, you'll immediately recognize this typical dark blue color. In fact, it's known as Chartres Bleu. And what is more interesting is that Chartres Cathedral and this cathedral were built about the same time. So it's a nice little invisible link between the two cathedrals. It's an extremely busy window. It requires a lifetime to discover what is there. The central lancet, third of the way down, does have an almost circular pattern with a very distinct scarlet quadrant, either side of which, if you look carefully, you'll see two rather gray, spindly arms with blood coming down from the hand being caught in a golden and a green chalice. And that is a bird's eye view looking on the top of Christ's head on the cross. And the large triangle of light blue glass flowing from that centerpiece is symbolic of the light being shed over the world as a result of Christ's sacrifice. It is called the prisoners of conscience window because nowadays the Trinity Chapel as a whole is handed over uh, to prayers for the prisoners of conscience. Witness the candle in a coil of barbed wire, the international amnesty sign, and every morning at half past seven there is a communion, and for a month a particular prisoner is prayed for. Colin, looking upwards at the vault of the Trinity Chapel, it's painted very delicately. The ribs are picked out in green and red, with uh, light cream uh, balls and what look like little arrow shapes. And then the spaces in between the ribs are in cream and very, very light, very delicate red outlining of bricks. Is all that original? It's not original. It's a reproduction of what the original was like. And indeed, the cathedral, when it was finished, was a blaze of colour from east to west. Wyatt lime washed over all this medieval paintwork, which was absolutely disgraceful. And now, when it came to the time to try and restore it, lime is a desiccant and it dries everything. And the paint underneath had become friable like dust. And you see these oily patches on either side of the choir aisles. They are all that is left of the original medieval paintwork, and it's where the oil from the paint had soaked into the stone.
Now we've come out into the cloisters of Salisbury Cathedral. This is a beautiful quadrangle with grass in the middle and two magnificent cedar trees. And the cloisters themselves have ten bays, I think it is, on each of the four sides. And the bays are filled with geometrical tracery, which isn't filled in with glass. And some of the columns of these openings, the one here, for instance, that I'm leaning against, are of Purbeck marble, and others are Chilmark stone, which is the main stone of the whole cathedral. But Colin, why were cloisters needed in a cathedral like Salisbury, which was always a secular foundation without monks? It's a point to ponder on. Not least are the cloisters the largest of any cathedral in the country. It was perhaps because the use of the Sarum rite, which became universally accepted as the way in which services were conducted, emanated from here, and also possibly because in the very early days, Salisbury almost became the Oxford of England. And the traditions of teaching and schooling are still very much alive here. There are no less than four schools within the close. There's a theological college. So there has been a tradition of learning in Salisbury. The cloisters are on the south side of the nave. And if we look back at the nave, we can see a lot more scaffolding and sheeting. What are they doing up there, Colin? Well, it's really a continuation of the repair on the stonework, which has been going on on the spire and the tower for the last six or seven years, and will continue up until the year 2020, which is a very long time and will require lots more money to be found. Now we've come out of the cloisters of Salisbury Cathedral into the chapter house and it's a wonderfully light building, it's octagonal and the walls are almost entirely made up of window with coloured glass, a lot of that colour is silver in fact and it's patterned in geometrical shapes and the tracery of the windows themselves is geometrical as it is in the cloisters. And in the middle of the chapter house is this very slender Purbeck marble column surrounded by even more slender Purbeck marble piers. And they lead up to the vault. The vault springs from those columns. And round the walls beneath the windows 
is a blind arcade and above it a frieze of carvings which look very early, which look very old to me. Are they in fact, Colin? Well, I think they suffered, as indeed the whole chapter has suffered, from a lot of restoration work. It was heavily restored during the 1890s, but it was restored before then too, because in the middle of the 1600s it was used, goodness knows why, as a prison for a lot of Dutch sailors who had been captured sailing up the Thames. And they did an awful lot of damage to the glasswork. And the glass that you see here is largely Victorian. The frieze is a very well-known frieze. And some of the carvings are original, and they portray stories in the Old Testament, starting with the creation of the world, and the frieze there showing God making sun and moon. Here we can see Noah building his ark, using the tools which would, he wouldn't have used, but are absolutely medieval tools. And then the animals going into the ark. And on the far wall, we can see the masons building the Tower of Babel, using again the tools that the medieval contemporaries used as well. Colin, what is the function of the chapter house? Well, it is where the dean and his three principal people, the chancellor and the precentor and the treasurer, who, when talked about collectively, are known as the chapter, would have conducted their business, deciding on policy, finances, services, and uh, what to do with the choir, and all the things that the dean and chapter busy themselves with. And is it still used for that function today? No, it isn't. Today, it houses the Magna Carta and some of the more precious items of the cathedral, and the dean and the chapter meet now in the dean's office largely because this is very chilly and being open to the cloisters there's quite a draft comes in so they do their business in more comfortable surrounds today
the solitary bell at Salisbury Cathedral, ringing out over the cloister before evensong. Salisbury may have lost its separate belfry tower, and with it a complete peal of bells, but it has preserved the loveliest as well as the tallest medieval spire in the whole of Christendom. My thanks to Colin Watts, chairman of the Day Guides, for accompanying me. All the music we heard was sung either by the girl choristers or the boy choristers, together with the lay vicars of Salisbury, directed by Richard Seal and accompanied by David Halls on a fine Willis organ, which is nearly 120 years old. They opened the programme with a setting of the Sanctus by Walter G. Alcock, who was organist here from 1917 to 1947. Earlier, Alcock had been assistant organist at Westminster Abbey, and the Sanctus was written for the coronation of George V there in 1911. Next, we heard Even Such Is Time, a text by Sir Walter Raleigh written as he was awaiting execution. It was set by Robert Chilcott specially for the girl choristers at Salisbury, and first performed during the 1993 Salisbury Festival. Richard Lloyd was assistant organist here in the 1950s and 60s, but he later returned in 1985 as headmaster of the Cathedral School, after periods as organist of both Hereford and Durham. Lloyd set the Magnificat for Salisbury in 1989. Michael Wise became organist here during the 1660s, but he had rather rocky relations with the clergy. He was accused of financial irregularities, lying and drunkenness. All the same, he was a favourite of Charles II, and his anthem, Prepare Ye the Way of the Lord, has remained in Salisbury's repertory. Bernard Rose is best known for his time directing the choir of Magdalen College, Oxford, but he'd been a chorister at Salisbury in the 1920s. We heard his anthem, Domine Dilexi, Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house, which was written in the 1950s for Salisbury Cathedral School. Richard Shepherd was a lay vicar at Salisbury, and he wrote the choirs of New Jerusalem for the Southern Cathedrals Festival in 1985. The boy choristers and lay vicars were joined by the trumpeter Martin Ings. Next, we heard Psalm 84, How Lovely Are Thy Dwellings, set to a chant by Walter Alcock. Then the Gloria from the Serum Mass by Kenneth Layton, first heard at Salisbury during the 1973 Southern Cathedrals Festival. After that, we heard more music by Bernard Rose, his Magnificat and Nunc Dimittis, written in the 1950s for the trebles of Magdalen College, Oxford, but sung here by the girl choristers at Salisbury. Finally, we heard the popular hymn tune, O Praise Ye the Lord, in its original context, in the impressive anthem, Hear My Words, Ye People, by Hubert Parry. He composed it for the Festival of the Salisbury Diocesan Choral Association in 1894. Choral Foundations was presented by Adrian Jack and the producer was Tim Thorne. Next week, Adrian visits Lincoln Cathedral in the company of Dr Nicholas Bennett, the cathedral's vice-chancellor and librarian.